Good morning and welcome to the 20th meeting of 2017 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Um, we have apologies from Mor Morris Golden. Peter Chapman is here as a substitute. Uh, before we move to the first item on the agenda, I want to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and electronic devices as they may affect the broadcast system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take item four in private. Are we all agreed? Yes, yes. I agree, agreed. Excellent. Um, the second item on of business on our agenda today is to hear evidence on the Wild Animals Travelling in Circuses Scotland Bill from the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform and Scottish Government officials. Welcome to you all. We're joined by Rosanna Cunningham, the Cabinet Secretary, Grant Campbell, the Bill Officer, Angela Lawson, Andrew Vos, who's um, a regular visitor to the committee, it seems, at the moment on this issue, and Beverly Williams, the Animal Welfare Team Leader. Um, unless you have any spe anything specific to say, Cabinet Secretary, I think we'll just move straight to questions. Uh, Kate Forbes. My first question is that um, it's been about three years now since the consultation on whether um, wild animals should be banned in um, travelling circuses was held. In that time period, has there been any new scientific evidence or have public views developed further? <coughs> Um, there's been some uh, opinion polling in that period. Um, there was a YouGov poll in 2016 which asked um, a thousand adults for their views on different animal welfare issues. Um, now, obviously, this is not being brought under animal welfare heading, or uh, rather, it's an ethical heading, but it, it does give some indication, and 76% uh, of respondents um, were in favour of this particular ban. Um, and there's, I'm aware that there's a current online petition which has received uh, over 2,000 signatures in support of the proposed prohibition. Um, so I'm not sure you would call that scientific, but as an indicator of where public opinion is, it's probably fairly um, uh, fairly indicative. Um, and also, because we're bringing the bill forward on ethical grounds rather than welfare grounds, in a sense, it's not so much the science and, and the evidence around welfare issues that becomes important here. It's a, it's a, it's a, different, a, a different question. Um, uh, yes, there is a gap between consultation and the introduction of the bill. Um, uh, it, really, some of it just reflects the time it takes to uh, to draft bills um, and decide on the process by which they're going to go into a programme for government. So really, that's where we are. So there's not been any significant changes really in that three year period? Not so, really. No. I mean, you could argue that the YouGov poll is probably quite a strong indicator that uh, um, what we what we consulted on what we understood to be the position in the Scottish public is in fact the position in the Scottish public. Um, volume of correspondence on this issue it has often been referred to as a factor in uh, justifying the legislation. So how do levels of correspondence from the public on this issue compare with correspondence received on other issues and how has that been quantified? Well, um, over... And really we, we, we've only counted it between January 2014 and May 2016. Um, there were over 150 bits of correspondence uh, on the matter and five parliamentary questions as well uh, in, that, in that period of time. Um, since then, we've had more on this than we've had on animal sanctuaries, rescue centres, rehoming activities, um, and the breeding and dealing of animals um, as well. Um, it, it, this exercises people's imagination, I think, in a, in, a, in a different way, and therefore they're more inclined to want to communicate their views on this. OK, thanks. <clears throat> Moving on, uh, Richard Lyle. Yes, uh, firstly, can I remind members that I am the cross-party convener for the Showman's Guild Scotland and an honorary member of the Showman's Guild, but can also say I support the intentions of this bill, 
but have reservations on re how it can be implemented. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I asked two council officials at our 6th June meeting if they had any concerns with this bill. In evidence to Committee Andrew Mitchell, Edinburgh Council said of the bill, and I quote, it strikes me, having read the bill and listened to the evidence so far, it will, will perhaps not be easy to enforce, as it had been suggested. David Kerr from Argyll Butte said that he also shared a lot of the concerns. Last week, I had a, a work experience uh, pupil, uh, Angus Holmes, and he contacted every council in Scotland regarding their position in wild animals and travel, travelling circuses. Most councils, to my knowledge, in Scotland either have a ban against circuses with wild animals or will refuse them a licence on their land. My point is, why do we need this bill if most councils oppose wild animals in circuses? Uh, well, first of all, you've used the word most, not all, uh, um, which, you know, if we leave it simply up to local authorities, that's, you know, one of the things that happens is you get differences between local authority and others, and it then becomes confusing as to what exactly the position uh, might be. Local authorities may also choose to apply things slightly differently, which again introduces a, uh, um, a, a different uh, uh, um, a, a variation a, a, around and across. Um, we have worked with local authorities on this. We've worked with COSLA, I think is right. So that it's not the case that we haven't been taking account of the local authority position. Um, uh, and so we think that this is the right thing to do from a national level to provide the kind of clarity um, to, to all of those who are involved in this business um, that Scotland will be a no-go area for wild animals and circuses. Well, uh, I have two other questions, Convener. Uh, can I ask who is, in, who is intended to be covered in this bill? Anthony Beckwith, in his uh, evidence to this committee, stated he believed his show is not a circus. He stated, and I quote, it's called an evening with lions and tigers. He stated he asked a government official to clarify whether it would be covered under the definition, and the official responded, I do not know. That was his evidence. I don't know if that, that meeting did take place. But do you intend to tighten up this legislation to cover shows without circus in their title? Um, just from a perspective of the use of the word circus, I mean, you know, we, we don't... As somebody whose background is in law, Overly defining doesn't help because you then l presume a whole list of things that are not in that definition. So sometimes overly defining, uh, defining doesn't help. Um, a commonly used notion of circus uh, is the one that had there been any, uh, you know, would there be any challenge would be uh, one for the for the courts to consider. But the the notion that you would have a commonly used word to describe uh, a, a performance. Um, court will decide whether it is on the, is not a circus. It doesn't have to be called a circus to be a circus, and arguably not everything that is called a circus uh, uh, would be of the nature of some of the conversation that we've had. I'm conscious of the Cirque du Soleil, for example, which is calling itself a circus, but isn't a circus in the traditional sense of the word. And I think that's the kind of right way to do this. I'm going to ask Andrew to come in here, though, because of the specific discussion that you were opening your comments with in terms of the... Just, just, before we comment, that if we may, just to be clear on this, the dictionary definition is along the lines of a circus is a company of acrobats, clowns and other entertainers which gives performances typically in a large tent and that a travelling circus mm. would be easily understood. But if you look at the example Mr Lyle has given before we come to a conversation that did or didn't take place, there are no acrobats or clowns, but it's former circus animals this organisation has applied for a circus licence in England and it's run by circus proprietors. So a wide de definition, quite a wide definition there of what a circus is, but it might not capture this. Do we, well, do we accept I, I that? Well, the difference, well, yes, it's, I mean, it would be what people would commonly understand. I think that, you know, and I defer to the to the lawyers here, mm. so we can hear from Andrew and then and then the I'm lawyers, who, you know, here, but, you know, my, my view would be that, you know, if, if, if you're putting on the kind of performance that is being discussed the, this evening with business, that I'm pretty sure a court would be likely to call that a circus 
or define it as a circus, even if it didn't, you know, it's not so much a dictionary definition, it's a kind of commonly understood, and that's a normal thing to do in, in law. It's not a, we're not proposing anything unusual in terms of not defining it too closely, because the minute you start listing things mm. in a definition, for example, that, it gives rise to exactly the questions mm. that you're asking. Well, if there aren't acrobats, does that make it a circus? Um, is the Cirque du Soleil properly calling itself a circus if it doesn't have animals in it? And things like that. So uh, maybe... Yeah. Absolutely. The cab, cab sec is right here. Um, where you have a definition which lists a specific thing, for example, a circus is a performance including acrobats and clowns, then organisations putting on a circus-like performance will merely omit the clowns and acrobats and keep everything else as a circus in order to avoid the definition of circus. And what we need to do here is to ensure that things which look like a circus, walk like a circus, talk like a circus, are considered a circus. Now, courts are very, very well versed in doing this and taking the ordinary interpretation of a word is something which courts do all the time. For example, in the... Um, equivalent English regulations which um, license animals for use in circuses, they do not define the term circus. It is left to ordinary interpretation because a court knows what a circus is. The ordinary man on the street knows what a circus is and what we want to ensure is that circus proprietors don't omit one specific aspect of performance in order to avoid a very rigid definition of circus. Um, and as to the specific example here, Andrew may have comments, but um, it would turn on the facts and circumstances of the case, ultimately. If there was a performance which was more akin to something you find at Edinburgh Zoo, which is a display of wild birds um, in an educational forum with zookeepers, that is very different from something which is performed in a ring with dressed-up entertainers, with jokes, with laughing. Um, but again, it's the nature of the performance, not the name of the performance. So it will really depend on what an evening with lions and tigers actually is. Um, and I think Anthony Beckwith has said what he thinks it is, but it would really be for a court to decide, um, is his performance in fact a circus? OK, can I, I'll let the Mark Russell come in on this. Um, I understand that. I gather in former evidence, I think you said that the definition of the circus would be the Oxford English Dictionary definition of the circus and that is quite specific. I mean it does mention travelling companies of acrobats, clowns etc. So it does list those. When, when Can you some... make the distinction between your general definition and what you've said on the record which is that Commonly this... Commonly understood definition yeah. of circus. I mean the courts <clears throat> will look at what is reasonable to describe as a circus, what is commonly understood. Um, and the, one of the reasons why that is done uh, is that sometimes common understandings do change over time. So you don't want to trap your legislation in a very specific period uh, if the common understanding begins to change. And that's why the phrase, the reasonable, the reasonable man, the reasonable person is always used, because that's, again, something that stays flexible. So reasonability can always be defined in a particular time and, and place and... and, and uh, uh, and therefore, you don't have to keep changing things. And that's why you don't overly define in legislation. OK, so this probably opens the door to move to Andrew Vos to, to talk to us about this particular example and whether it would or wouldn't be covered in your interpretation. Yeah, um, first of all, I'd just like to clear up the issue about what was said at the meeting that we had with the circus industry. Um, we did agree that we'd hold the meeting under the Chatham House rules, so we wouldn't attribute personal comments to what was said. But um, as it's been raised, I'd just like to clear up um, the situation. I have discussed this with colleagues, and I think they've confirmed that at no time did I just say, I don't know, regarding whether this... I, 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 know, I know you didn't, I didn't say that. I didn't name but, anyone. No, no, no. And well, that's, I thought it would be my, unfair to name anyone. I think my name appears in the record, so that's what... You didn't say that, but I know Anthony Beckwith did. So uh, the, the point was what I may well have said, that if I was being given examples of various types of show or enterprise, what I may have said was that I don't know exactly what your particular act entails, but then I would have probably gone on to say that if it entails things that would commonly be understood to be a circus, then it would be caught by the bill. 
Now, regarding the particulars of the evening with lions of tigers, or what I now understand is called Big Cats Live, in that case, it's using former circus animals. It's run by circus proprietors, people who have been involved with circuses for all their life. I don't know exactly if it's performed in a tent or in a circular arena, but the, you know, it's a, a travelling show of some sort. Lions are, and tigers are, I believe, performing the sort of um, tricks or behaviours or examples of the sort of training that's given for circus performances are given. Um, it's, I believe, licensed as a circus in England, and it's also operated by somebody who calls himself the last lion tamer in England. Now, I think most people would agree that it's maybe more than just one clown short of a circus. It is actually a circus. Thank you. Uh, one last question, if you don't mind, convener. Um, some members of the public believe that animals should not be used in zoos, or fets, or galas. Martin Burton, chairman of the Association of Circus Proprietors of Great Britain, said, and again I quote, I am an animal welfareist too. However, once we start banning things, particularly on ethical grounds, it will clearly spread. If it is not ethically right to have a wild animal in a circus, it is not ethically right to have a wild animal appear at a gala, shopping centre or a zoo. Can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary, is this a rocky road to banning reindeer at Christmas shows, banning zoos and wildlife parks and all other shows that the public attend? No. Thank you. That was short and sharp. Thank you. Uh, Emma Harper. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I am interested in the ethics and the welfare of the um, animals, whether they're performing or being exhibited or displayed. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I tried to tease out the difference between ethics and welfare. And uh, it is difficult, I know, to separate them. So I'm curious about pursuing the ban on ethical grounds versus welfare grounds. I would like to hear your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I mean, the, the ethical grounds, really, I suppose, we're looking at the, the, the concept of taking animals which are not domesticated animals, wild animals, and effectively, well, the, the use of the word is taming them, but it's effectively finding a way to coerce them into behaviours which aren't natural behaviours um, and, uh, uh, and proceeding on that basis. And it's kind of ethical. You know, the, the animals may be well fed, they might be well looked after, there might not be the kind of some of the individual welfare grounds that you would look at, but there's a kind of sense in which this is not the right way to, uh, uh, to, to manage wild animals. Domesticated animals um, are generally... Uh, uh, used in all sorts of different circumstances for all sorts of different reasons, but they're domesticated, they're accustomed to, 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 to behaving in certain ways, um, they're, they're not uh, uh, usually um, uh, distressed. If they were distressed, it would be a welfare issue, but they're not usually distressed. Dogs, people see, they like to, they like to please their, their masters, they like to do work, they like to, they like to run about. Um, there's lots of animals in that category that are animals that are, you know, accustomed to to working um, and being with human beings, and that sets them uh, apart. Um, ethics, the ethics is around the use of an animal that is wild in nature, not a domesticated animal that is accustomed to living with human beings and working with human beings, and then finding a management method by which you coerce them to almost act against all of their better instincts. Um, uh, welfare grounds um, uh, uh, would raise a, a lot of very specific issues um, uh, and uh, it, that could well have been quite difficult too because, you know, the welfare, as I said, the, the lions, the tigers might be well looked after, they could be healthy, they could be, you know, not exhibiting um, actual distress. But the ethics of the situation leads is leads us to the view that you shouldn't be using animals like that in these circumstances. Um, uh, welfare grounds, you would need to have gone down quite a lot of detail. You'd need an awful lot of very detailed information about the actual circumstances, and the investigation of that would be very difficult. Because some, some of these animals would be very well looked after, others wouldn't 
be necessarily as well looked after. Okay, I think. Um, thank you for that clarification because I, I'm going down the lines of it is easier to define ethics rather than welfare. Is it just time that we stop having wild animals like tigers and lions in circuses for performance, exhibition, display, entertainment? Well, I mean, clearly we wouldn't have had the manifesto commitment to do this bill if we didn't think that was time uh, uh, um, to begin seriously beginning to look at that. And that's why we've chosen we've chosen to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a whole lot of animals out there that are domesticated, accustomed to working with, with us as human beings, doing jobs, you know, right around the world, they're doing jobs for, for us and, and enthusiastically doing so. So they are in a different category for that reason. Okay, thank you. Finley Carson. Thanks, Convener. Good morning. Um, given that the impact of travelling is one of the three ethical concerns that were given to justify the legislation why um, wild animals shouldn't be transported by uh, circuses in Scotland, as long as they're not being used in performance. So should, should uh, the legislation not go far, as far to, to actually ban all uh, travelling circuses, whether they're performing or not? Why, why, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm not quite understand that. Why uh, would a travelling circus have yeah. animals if they weren't performing? If the, the, the bill or, or the legislation is based on three ethical reasons. Sure. One of those is the impact of travelling. So why does a bill not prevent wild animals travelling in Scotland as long as they're not performing? So one of the examples we had was that there were uh, circus animals wintered in the north of Scotland, oh, the, the, and the bill will oh, not see. cover those, okay. the legislation won't cover those. Why would that be? Um, well, I, I suppose we were trying to ensure, um, first of all, that, that we could uh, uh, manage this and uh, uh, get this through uh, um, without overly complicating things. Um, there is an issue about, uh, uh, there's a number of issues around it, because uh, what we've not got a general ban on the keeping or transportation of wild animals um, by members of the public or charitable or commercial, commercial organisations. And remember, this is about performance. The ethics were around performance here and not at this point, not necessarily about the travelling. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and it's that's where we just want to keep the, those two things, uh, those two things separately. Um, uh, I mean, there are other reasons why wild animals are moved around. For example, they'll go from safari park to safari park or whatever. Um, and we didn't see that if we began, you know, we felt if we began to go down into that uh, level of looking at it, it would become incredibly complicated. And some of the issues about, you know, that you're already raising in terms of definition would become even, uh, would become even uh, greater. Um, uh, uh, you know, there, 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 there are, uh, um, uh, we, we think that some of the, the, the ethical arguments could be weaker around some of the issues that you're raising. And because we'd chosen to go down the ethics ground, it was better to stick with the much stronger lines and, and, uh, and uh, deal with those. Um, uh, so, at the moment, um, at the moment, we're confident that what we've done in this bill is is the right thing to do just now, and that doesn't preclude coming back and looking at some of the other ethics issues uh, around the use of wild animals. But at present, this is about the performance and their use in travelling circuses. Um, and so some of the other things, once you begin to explore some of the other things, it does become infinitely more complex. What you're saying, Cabinet Secretary, if animals are wintered here over a period, circus animals, they're in a static situation, mm. their um, welfare considerations, etc., would be covered by the likes of the SSPCA going in there. And as long as they weren't performing, that's there's, the rationale. The for, ethics, yeah. Yes. The ethics doesn't apply. I mean, yeah. you're, you're moving it into the kind of welfare side of things. And for welfare issues, you, have to, you would have to be much more um, uh, uh, careful about 
what you were what you were looking at. And you know, you are into the situation as well because a lot of safari parks in the in the UK where people will move animals from one to the other and they're not performing when they get there. They're being moved and then they're effectively static in a safari park, but their their behaviours and their lifestyle is much more uh, akin to their normal um, wild existence than it would be uh, in a circus. Just on, on the back of that, the, the SNP manifesto committed to uh, banning wild animals in circuses, and it didn't uh, refer exclusively to travelling circuses. So why does the bill not cover static circuses, particularly from what you said, that uh, a number of ethical reasons used for justifying the banning of wild animals would also apply to animals in static circuses. So we're looking at wild animals performing. And that was one of the reasons mm. you said you're only looking at as part of the bill. So why, why are you not covering wild animals in static circuses? Because, because there is a kind of slightly weaker ethical argument around that. Um, uh, for example, um, if there was well-designed permanent accommodation in a particularly fixed location um, and the environmental um, surroundings that, uh, uh, that, that could be provided, um, then there would be a weakened um, ethical argument as compared to the travelling circuses. Um, uh, I, I think you did have some evidence uh, during the evidence sessions that, um, uh, that the situation is worse in a travelling circus as opposed to static circuses. But it appears, um, appears you're, you're, you're in between because the first question I asked, the justification for not applying it to animals that were involved in circuses were, was that they could be housed in Scotland but they weren't actually performing so it wasn't quite so bad ethically. And your answer to this one is, well, actually, it's all about the travelling because animals are in nice cages well, or whatever. But it's about both, really. I mean, it's about the travelling and, you know, w you know where they are and and uh, you know a static um, uh, situation will have reduced quite a lot of the, you know, uh, you would then get into definitions of what what static means in these circumstances, and overwintering animals is manifestly not a circus. They are they are being they're being housed, they're being um, looked after, but it's manifestly not a circus. If, if we were to go into static circuses, then you would have to be looking at a much wider range of, of ethical issues around how the animals were being managed in a static environment. Um, uh, so this bill is about the travelling circuses and, and the use of wild animals in those circumstances. That, you know, that, your answer you just gave just doesn't stack up as far as I'm concerned because what you're saying is in a static situation, the accommodation is going to be better and all that's going to be better. So that's welfare. That's all about welfare. That's nothing to do with ethics. The ethics of, of forcing these wild animals to perform is exactly the same. And this bill is, is built on ethical issues rather than welfare issues. But your answer to the static thing was, was all about welfare. Your evidence veered into welfare as well. I think the evidence that I, that I quoted tended to talk about welfare um, too. I mean, we've, we've, we've stuck to the travelling circuses because we think the ethical arguments are strongest there. And I think when you move away from travelling circuses, then, then the, the ethical arguments do become much more mixed with welfare arguments, and then it becomes harder to, to tease out the two different things. And it is, it is you know, it isn't as easy uh, uh, the further away you move from the travelling circuses, the, the, the balance of genetics and welfare isn't, um, isn't just quite as clear. Mark Roscoe. Those ethical arguments are based on public opinion and the surveys that have been done over a number of years about circuses. What about public opinion on other forms of performance where wild animals are used? What's, what's the basis for that? Um, I'm sorry, what, what do you mean? <clears throat> What's public opinion? What is public opinion on other forms of animal performance that use wild animals? Because I'm not. I mean, the, the the YouGov poll that I quoted was talking about circuses, not uh -huh. not other forms. I mean, I'm not conscious of there having been any um, particularly uh, um, major opinion surveys on other uses 
um, of of wild animals. Uh, I, I mean, what? Sorry, you'd have to give me some examples. What you, you is this the is this things like the falconry displays well, and the let, and clear. things I mean, like that? No. Cabinet Secretary, you've indicated the government's intent to legislate on a wide range of other forms of animal performance when the time's right. But the focus of this bill is on wild animals in circuses as loosely defined in common law as we understand it, round tent, with or without acrobats, whatever. I'm trying to understand why you're taking that approach rather than the approach that's been taken in Wales, which has been to take a more broader approach rather than a piecemeal approach and look at other forms of animal performance. The, the basis for you, as I understand it, focusing in on circuses is that there is an overwhelming public concern about circuses. So I'm asking you, what are the public concerns about other forms of animal performance, whether that's raptor shows or reindeer or, you know, anything else? To be else? honest, I'm not conscious, to be honest, that there... Why, why um, focus on this one? There is. I mean, there, there's... I'm not aware of any um, equivalent to the opinion polling exercise. So. <clears throat> Okay, I, I'm just kind of being reminded that the, the, the I mean, th there is an opinion survey work along the same lines. So there's very clear questions asked in terms of circuses, but not, but not anything else. Um, and uh, the, the, the letters uh, uh, that I referred to earlier, um, again, were about circuses. Um, uh, um, one of the things that we want to th think about doing is encompassing some of the other issues um, uh, in secondary welfare legislation, mm -hmm. which would be under the 2006 mm -hmm. uh, legislation. Um, and that will, that will deal with some of the zoo licensing stuff, bringing it up to speed and all the rest of it. Um, uh, so that's being thought about in terms of a statutory instrument in context of 2006. And of course, that's the Animal Health and Welfare Act, and it's back again to the difference between welfare and ethical grounds. And the, the public opinion uh, uh, on this is clear. We don't have obvious concern raised by the public on some of the other issues um, uh, that, that might be looked at. I mean, I, I, I'm not aware of anything about some of the other displays that, that, that might go on. Wouldn't it have been easier just to ask the public what their views are about a range of incidences where wild animals are used in performance? And then you would have then had an indication of whether circuses was the top ethical consideration or something else was the top ethical consideration. Well, I don't think the YouGov poll was ours. Um, okay. uh, I, I don't think the YouGov poll was ours. I mean, we did a consultation, and the consultation was around circuses. So, you know, all of the information that we've got is directed towards circuses. The YouGov poll um, was interesting because it talked about a range of other animal welfare issues, and this one was a specific question asked within that. But we've not gone out and done opinion poll surveying. When it comes to the statutory instrument, there will be further work done um, uh, around that to see what people's uh, uh, views and concerns are and some of those, uh, on some of those other ancillary issues. Uh, but keeping in mind that that's a statutory instrument in the context of welfare uh, uh, law rather than ethics. So that I'm sure we could have asked, but that would have been, you know, um, I think the further you go out there, the more you, you get the confusion between welfare and ethics. Mm. This one is an easier one, we think, to deal with just simply through ethics. Mm. But if YouGov, have asked, if YouGov had asked a different question, it might have given a different basis. Well, for, they didn't. For they asked a question about wild animals and circuses. And right, so okay. that's it. You're basing your priorities on it. Just to get a, a feel for this, what sort of timeline would you be working to roughly in terms of bringing forward that secondary legislation? Absolutely no idea because we've got no idea what the impact of Brexit is going to be on our legislation as well. So I, I can't give you any. Into okay. All I can say is that's that's something that we would be um, looking to to, to to think about doing, but I, I can't tell you when it becomes possible to do it. Okay. Can I just explore in Cabinet Secretary to the issue about the definition of what a wild animal is? Are you content that as it's as the 
legislation is drafted, it captures all the categories you want to. And I'm thinking particularly of the argument that's been advanced by some that a, a third or fourth generation um, circus animal may not display the behaviours that they ought to or, or might. Are you content you've got this drawn tightly enough? Um, I think as, uh, as much uh, as one possibly can, I think there's a fairly, uh, again, clear understanding that you know, it doesn't matter how many generations of lions that you have, a lion is not a domesticated animal. Um, you may be able to tame an individual lion. Uh, I'm not sure at any stage how much anybody would trust that taming process implicitly. Um, I've seen some remarkable footage that suggests that in some cases you might be able to, but I don't think anybody would be any, in any doubt that lions, tigers, leopards, whatever, are actually wild animals. Um, uh, you know, all animals, whether wild or domesticated, are capable of bearing their ancestral teeth, sometimes literally, um, but we're aware of the difference between domesticated and wild. We know a domesticated animal when we, when we see it and interact with it, um, as opposed to straightforward wild animals. Okay. Is there perhaps a need and guidance to make clear what isn't covered by this legislation? I'm thinking things like birds of prey, camel racing, llamas, the all examples that have been given to us. Is there a need The minute you list what isn't covered, by definition, you open up the door to anything that isn't on that list. Mm. And that's the problem with the defining. And, you know, again, you would uh, expect the courts to uh, apply a common understanding in these circumstances, which is what the courts do on a daily basis throughout all bits of legislation that are ever kind of passed. I mean, if you start listing animals that are definitely excluded and then oops you've missed one that's a loophole that you've built in and this is the this is the problem yeah. with the definition okay claudia beamish thank you convener good morning cabinet secretary and uh, the and officials could i ask please about the discretionary nature of the obligation on local authorities to enforce the bill um, and uh, whether um, a more statutory arrangement um, could make it more robust. And uh, following on from that, the lack of provision that would enable local authorities to prevent a circus from operating while they investigate and report a matter to the procurator fiscal or obtain record or to obtain records from the operator. And this was highlighted by local government um, officials who came before us, and their concern was that by the time um, something had been uh, assessed. Uh, as to whether it should go forward um, through the courts that um, the, the circus may well have moved on and indeed um, possibly gone abroad. So I wonder if you have any comment on those issues. Uh, well, first of all, I'm being reminded by uh, Andrew that we will be producing um, guidance to local authorities um, uh, as, as part of this, so they're, they're not entirely uh, going to be uh, uh, left adrift. We've also been talking to COSLA uh, 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 about all of this. Um, what this bill does is it pretty much uses the 2006 um, Health and Welfare Act as a, as a way of creating an offence and giving powers of enforcement. So it's based on that same model. Uh, it's not different uh, in that sense to what is already uh, in existence. Um, that's basically uh, because we don't want to overburden uh, a local authority. We expect that a local authority would be able to ascertain if a wild animal was being uh, used um, and a local authority inspector would then have powers under the bill uh, which uh, they would be able to use. Um, uh, so uh, the bill, again, as I've indicated, mirrors the 2006 powers. Um, it was felt that there shouldn't be a greater duty of enforcement on wild animals in circuses than the general welfare requirements uh, under the 2006 Act. Um, we're taking these two things as commensurate rather than one gazumping uh, the other. Um, and the bill 
does also allow Scottish ministers some flexibility to appoint inspectors uh, as well as local authorities. So it wouldn't just be up to local authorities to appoint inspectors um, if there were local authorities that we thought were perhaps not enforcing this. There is a power in the bill for ministers to um, uh, appoint uh, an alternative inspector. Um, in terms of the, the uh, reporting uh, to the fiscal or obtaining records, um, we believe that the current enforcement powers are proportionate, will provide a clear and effective deterrent. Um, it does seem from your evidence that none of the big licensed circuses, the, the ones that exist in the UK or the bigger European circuses are likely to ever tour with wild animals in Scotland as a result of this. So uh, we believe that the current powers are sufficient uh, for, those, uh, for those purposes. I'm the sorry, is that covered? Just, it, well, it was highlighted because of the travelling nature of the, the circus that um, it might be appropriate to consider in secondary legislation um, or guidance the, um, the power to prevent the circus operating while the investigation was, um, was taking place, um, which is uh, something that was highlighted uh, by, by the local government officers. I think our view is that that would be tipping the balance into a much more onerous um, set of circumstances. Do you want we, to come in, Angela? We, there is a policy aspect and a legal aspect here, and obviously there's, there's different types of enforcement regimes you can put in place, um, but um, we have opted for here to have the, um, a significant offence provision without some sort of fixed penalty notice or compliance notice letter regime, because we need a significant deterrent there are no current well, um, travelling circuses in Scotland with wild animals. And what we need to do is, is not to have a system of easily administrative letters that can go out to circuses, because this is not an offence that's going to happen on a regular basis. We need a, a significant uh, penalty attaching to this offence to deter people from coming. And that's why we have opted to go with um, the offence, the, the significant penalty and a prosecution for a criminal offence rather than a mere compliance notice, please desist, and, or the option of a fixed penalty notice which could um, lead to issues of decriminalisation. We want the, the big ticket offence effectively as a deterrent value. Right, uh, thank you. And uh, could I just also ask you, Cabinet Secretary, um, David Kerr from Argyle and Butte, highlighted a concern, and I quote, that the ethical basis for the legislation could make it easier for a defendant to defend themselves. And I just wondered if you had any comment on that. Well, I mean, every, every case will be argued on its own individual merits. Um, uh, I think it's a fairly um, clear and straightforward thing for a, uh, a court to consider. Um, if they know that the legislation is... Um, uh, is designed on ethical grounds, that's how the court will look at it. Um, uh, um, uh, we don't believe it makes it any more difficult uh, to enforce. Uh, on one view, it's you know, possible the welfare offence would have been more difficult uh, to prove because that would rely on expert evidence of individual animal suffering as opposed to the more broad ethical arguments um, that will be argued in terms of a court. Right, thank you. And I was going to ask you about the definition of circus and lack of clarity around that in relation to enforcement, but I think the point has been covered in your earlier remarks, so thank you. OK, thank you. Any members have any further questions? No? Cabinet Secretary, thank you. The committee will obviously come to a view on the strengths and weaknesses of the bill in due course. Um, I thank you and your officials for your time today. Um, I'm going to suspend for five minutes to allow for a change in officials and for a comfort break. Thank you.
Uh, welcome back to this meeting of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. The committee will now hear evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform and her company officials on a general update on her portfolio. Can I welcome back the Cabinet Secretary, Keith Connell, the Deputy Director of Natural Resources, Chris Stark, Director of Energy and Climate Change, and Mike Palmer, the Deputy Director, Marine Scotland. Unless you want to say anything in general, Cabinet Secretary, we'll, we'll just move to questions. Okay, and uh, to kick this off on the subject of the impact of Brexit is uh, Dave Stewart. Uh, thank you. I mean, uh, good morning, panel. Um, obviously, Brexit's uh, on all our headlines currently. Uh, I'm interested in finding out what work um, the Scottish Government is carrying out preparing and planning for Brexit. Well, there's a very great deal um, of work um, being undertaken, um, as you might imagine. Um, we are... Uh, as you can expect, um, uh, pretty much continuing to uh, press uh, the Westminster government uh, on its plans, but more importantly, to for, uh, press for better engagement. Um, uh, what we're currently uh, involved in doing, and I may say that I've actually now written to uh, uh, yourself, um, convener four times, most recently 14th uh, of June, uh, in terms of this issue. Um, uh, we've also had a debate in the chamber, and I did have a um, brief meeting with Michael Gove, the new minister, um, uh, uh, on 22nd of uh, uh, June, impressing on him the desire for us to have a proper schedule of meetings that aren't unilaterally cancelled. Um, uh, when, when it's appropriate. But um, I think it's, you know, we've obviously as a government set out detailed proposals. They're on the record. I won't uh, go into them uh, in uh, a great deal of detail. Um, there's an enormous amount of working going on within the civil service uh, amongst officials um, to try and map the potential impact of this. Um, this portfolio and uh, the rural economy portfolio are probably the two most um, uh, impacted by uh, uh, what is happening uh, and the uh, and the outflow from the Great Repeal Bill, um, and uh, trying to uh, trying to estimate the impact of that within uh, uh, within our work is is actually a huge uh, job and is actually now taking up the time of quite a lot of officials, as you can imagine. But we are working. Uh, um, across the two portfolios to try and uh, make that uh, uh, proper uh, assessment. Um, and, uh, you know, that's got to be both policy and financial, uh, which is the other uh, aspect of this. Um, uh, we, um, uh, we, are, we are trying to, at the moment, assess the impact of this on the government work going forward, but we're still slightly in the dark, really, as to um, how that is going to progress, which is why I'm a little bit cautious when I'm asked about future um, proposals and timescales for statutory instruments and things like that, because we're just not quite certain how this is going to roll through uh, the remainder of this parliamentary uh, um, session. I appreciate, Cabinet Secretary and panel, it's very difficult to answer some of these questions. Um, because you'd need the protective powers of the brands here to work out what exactly is happening from day to day. Uh, but have you looked at issues such as a, a risk register? Let me give you an example uh, on the structural funds. Um, SNH uh, rightly have used uh, high amounts of rural development funding under Pillar 2 uh, within their uh, organisation. Uh, we could face the scenario that we won't have fully funded structural funds um, post-2020. Do you have an effective register which say, if this happens, this would be the effect on our budgets and our activities? Is it that level of detail, or is that more at the macro level no, of the department? We, we are having to look at it at that level of detail as well, so, uh, and, and make, in some cases, individual decisions about uh, some of the, the, the things that mm. we, you know, we may have to prioritise. why I said there's both a policy and a financial uh, impact of this that has, mm. to be, has to be looked at. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of vital support comes in from EU funding. Um, uh, and uh, uh, without any kind of certainty as to 
what the consequences will be post-Brexit on that. It makes it extremely difficult to uh, uh, um, manage it in this, particularly over this period, um, where you know some of the uh, um, things might be open to to applications, but we don't know quite what the what the longer term impact is going to be, um, uh, and that we think is having an impact on some of the some of the decisions that are being made by people in terms of what to apply for. Um, I, just as a small example, the, there's an agri-environment climate scheme, which um, uh, last year wasn't taken up in the way we had expected it to. And we think it's because people were not confident that it was going to roll through um, in, you know, over, over the longer period. Um, we've now achieved um, the ability to make that commitment. So the new scheme will open in January, but I've given six months advance warning of that. But that's the kind of thing, you, you know, almost bit by bit by bit, you're having to look at each and every one of these to try and work out, well, you know, where are we going to be post, well, 2019 at the outset, depending on how things uh, go. My final question, and you touched on this earlier, is, is about the effect on staffing. Um, the same way you can't spend a pound twice, you can't spend the staff twice. If they're being utilised to do Brexit work, they're not doing the day job. What's the effect that's having on your officials? And Chris Stark and others may wish to comment on that. And I suppose the other little example I'm giving, um, I heard f uh, from Spice earlier that DEFRA have just advertised 40 new posts to deal with Brexit. Is that something you're looking at? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not the right person to ask. It wouldn't be my decision about numbers uh, to be recruited into the civil service. I'm sure um, all of the officials that are here would uh, be very grateful if we were uh, to hand them over the equivalent. But the, if DEFRA is taking on 40, that would, do, you know, you'd be looking about four here. So it, it's probably not just quite as dramatic as it sounds mm. uh, in reality. Um, uh, yes, they are working incredibly hard and a, a good fair amount of their time uh, is, is having to be taken up in those considerations. But so far, um, uh, they've all um, performed incredibly well when it comes to the non-Brexit part of the portfolio. So I'm confident that they are going to be able to, to, to maintain that going forward. Um, I'm saying that. Um, I don't want to constrain them too much if, uh, if there are some areas where there's uh, uh, um, difficulties. I mean, I'm, you, know, there are, you know, for example, for Chris Stark, he's, he's, he's having to, at the moment, think in terms of, well, will there be an EUTS or will there not be an EUTS? We don't have any guidance whatsoever from anywhere at the Westminster level about that. Um, so it, there's a bit of juggling has to go on, but the juggling, in a sense, is also part of the day job for Chris. I don't know if Chris wants to say anything about that. Yeah, I can, um, very briefly, there's, I suppose there's several parts to this, um, and Ms Cunningham's entirely right. I mean, I would love to have 40 new posts, if anyone would like to give them to me. Um, uh, I'm not sure I'd use them all for Brexit. Mm -hmm. um, however, that Barnett consequential? Is indeed, yeah, that? probably there are. <laughs> um, uh, however, I think, I think there's kind of a number of things that we were in, a kind of, we're in a planning phase at the moment, so there's quite a lot of, um, you might say, intellectual capacity being used up in the civil service about that. Mm. I suspect that will change as it becomes clearer quite how Brexit will pan out. Um, and here, I suppose, for the committee, the interesting question is um, there are some parts of this portfolio and indeed the whole of the government's um, agenda in general, actually, that, that will have different roles post, as Brexit unfolds. So we are waiting to see the extent to which, for example, new developed powers come to, to, come to Scotland and, and there, there is therefore a requirement mm. to, to put in place administration and, and policy posts there. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, this, it is mainly a planning thing and within the Scottish Government uh, as a whole, the civil service, we've been restructuring slightly to prepare. But I expect more work later, I suppose, is the easiest way to do it. And fine, I'm conscious of time coming. Um, is there, um, if you're taking staff off their day job to do Brexit, um, are you finding in the end you're going to have to ditch some um, some other activities that you're currently doing? Because they can't they can't do the job twice. Is the, the point you made? Day, some of that will be my decision. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, if sure. in, in terms of, of of looking at looking forward and then making decisions about what are priorities and what are not priorities, and that you know isn't something I can fix now for the whole uh, of the remainder of the parliamentary session. So um, you know we're we're 
constantly doing that. I, I have a process. Um, the way I work is I tend to um, get have short meetings with all policy teams about twice a year. Um, and one of the purposes of that is for me to see what they're working on, what their priorities are, um, and my understanding then that if I want them to do something else or if they're having to do something else, I've, that there has to be a decision made about what is priority. It wouldn't be for officials to, date, to take that decision. Mm, it would sure. be my decision um, to, to perhaps push something further down the list because of what was, uh, what was required. I mean, the work that is being done, as I indicated at the moment, that's not a case where we're, we're doing it. Um, I can see on the horizon that we may have to be in that place, which is why I indicated in the earlier session that I, couldn't, I can't say you know, how and when the statutory instrument that we discussed then would, would be brought forward, because clearly um, there could be all sorts of potential things that would have to take priority. You know, um, uh, you know, if we have to, uh, uh, if, if we've got to um, deal with other things that are, are, are more important. I mean, there is a, there is a, as I indicated, there's a team set up and they're looking right across environment, agriculture, marine, forestry. Um, uh, and obviously there's also going out beyond the two portfolios. There's a lot of civil servants in a wide range of different roles who are uh, supporting ministers on this particular um, bit of our day job. Because actually, this is also our day job mm. to try and manage this process. Mm. Thank you, Kabir. OK, thanks. Um, moving on and, and perhaps looking at where there's conflict in the workload for Chris Stark and yourself, there's also the small matter of putting together a new climate bill and finalising the draft climate plan. And that's the area we're going to move on to now. Uh, Alex Burnett. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Um, uh, in, our, in the report uh, the committee made on the draft climate change, we, we made a number of recommendations, and I'd just like to uh, ask three very brief questions. Uh, the first was uh, that we wanted to see the carbon envelopes for transport and agriculture to be revised to show greater ambition. I just wonder if the Cabinet Secretary has any intention to increase those envelopes. Well, we're working uh, um, through the various parliamentary recommendations at the moment. I have actually noted the uh, questions raised on that. I mean, obviously, the principal priority here has got to be to produce a plan um, which uh, works towards an abatement of emissions across all sectors, uh, uh, and that's you know heading for 80% by 2050. Um, uh, so we can achieve that in a variety of different ways. Um, uh, but we've taken on board the, the 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 questions raised about the two particular sectors um, and. Uh, that will be taken into account. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the second one is about the Times model, and maybe one for Chris. I know he's been very uh, helpful in uh, the transparency of the model. Uh, I wonder if there's any more uh, information or news on uh, future model runs and how the model is going to be made accessible uh, to others. It, it is being updated, as I understand That's it. Right. And David Stewart asked a question during the statement, which I didn't immediately know the answer to, but I gave him a note afterwards about has the model been run to um, take the EUTS out of the system. And in fact, it had been. So in a sense, this crosses over into Brexit preparation as well as the Times modelling, Chris. So, so we are constantly looking at it. Yeah, and we'll continue to use it. So um, uh, the, the current uh, challenge for us is to update the model with revised data, um, and then we'll, we plan to use it again throughout the year. Sorry, is there some time scale for when that might uh, the, be? The main time scale for, for us is, and of course Ms Cunningham's in the lead on this, is, is the publication of the final plan. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, sorry. Yes, um, another couple of areas that I think the committee suggested might be looked at with another rerun was CCS and some of the assumptions around uh, transport modal shift. Has there been any work done on those two? Um. In terms of the Times model? Mm -hmm. Shall I answer? Yes. Um, there, there's been no specific work on those things, but both of those, both of those issues are in play when it comes to future modelling runs. So. Sorry, I didn't hear that. I'm so sorry. Don't worry. And the, uh, both of those issues, there's been, there's been no specific analytical work to refine the analysis in those sectors, but we'll, we'll look at both of those issues in future modelling runs using Times. I think if we just go back, I mean, it isn't just, you know, 
feed something in here, press a button, and it all chunters out the other end in a in a in a, in, in, in 20 minutes. So actually, making the the, the model run is is a bit more. Um, complex than that. So obviously there's been one done without EUTS to see how that impacted. So there will be other such runs done. Um, I, I don't know uh, the extent to which um, the committee wants to be kept up to date on them all. I'm picking up some colleagues that are a bit confused. Would this inform the final plan, yes. this work? Right. Does that clarify it? <laughs> like specifically, it does to a degree, but I'd like specifically to understand, in view of the concerns that were expressed by the committee, uh, whether there will be, um, and I'm not naive about, I know it doesn't take 20 minutes to run, which is why we didn't make suggestions about very many alternative runs, but is there to be uh, an alternative run, as the convener asked, on, uh, without CCS, and is there to be one on active travel, which was a real concern for this committee? I mean, I'll pick that up. So, that, so that the, what, what the model looks at is a set of policy assumptions. So the, the yes. final policy assumptions that, that go into the model will inform the final modelling run. So, yes. I, so I, I'm not to be obtuse about it, but that's it. So both of those issues are, are, are built completely into the, yeah. into the modelling that we plan for the rest of the year. Thank you. Come back with the final point was uh, one of the recommendations was to establish a, a monitoring and reporting framework um, with the, uh, an anticipated 12-month gap between the publication of a draft plan and the publication of a fa final plan. Um, I wonder if you could clarify what the implications of this might be and why this is happening, and, is, and will there be a reporting the framework? The 12-month gap and the monitoring yeah. plan. Well, I mean, partly uh, um, we, we, we did have to kind of... We had a conversation about the balance between publishing in autumn um, and publishing into uh, 2018. Um, uh, uh, 2018 um, uh, uh, allowed it to dovetail with the energy strategy, um, and we thought that was that made more sense than publishing in, you know, much, you know, a few months earlier. But then you would be adrift of the energy strategy, which would be quite uh, impactful in terms of uh, in terms of what's here. Uh, um, uh, and in terms of the, on terms of the conversation, um, uh, we are and are still constantly getting feedback from stakeholders. That that whole section of activity hasn't stopped, um, um, and uh, we are also uh, um, uh, building on the work um, set out in the plan in respect of uh, monitoring framework. And officials are going to be in touch. Uh, we're engaging with the Committee on Climate Change on this particular issue to, to make sure that um, what, we, what we think would work is, from their perspective, the kind of thing that they would want to see. Um, and we will be back in touch um, with the Committee um, uh, to discuss how best to engage Parliament and parliamentary committees in that particular process of monitoring. So we are looking at that um, uh, uh, not just in terms of the plan itself, but how we how we move that forward and how Parliament contributes to that as well. So, okay, can, I, can I take that? That's, that's a yes. You are going to be establishing a monitoring and reporting framework. Well, I think I said at the outset yeah. yes. That's the I mean, we're, But the point is that we are continuing to work on this. Yeah. We're working with the Committee on Climate Change on it. Um, you know, we're looking at how best Parliament can contribute right. to that. And, so yes, and, we are. Okay. And, so, and so, what do you think the timescale for that? establishing that framework will be? Um, Chris, I don't know whether or not you've got a specific time scale for that. <laughs> you know, I, I mean... Certainly, well, <laughs> do, I do. I mean, I think um, it, it, it's essential, I think, that we have something at, at companies, a final plan, and it sets out how that plan will be monitored. So that's, again, that's the, that's the milestone I have in my mind. Subject to Ms. Cunningham's right. views. Okay. okay. What, one of the other recommendations, I think, that came from all of the committees was that the government look at the scrutiny period for future iterations of the, of, um, the RPPs. I, I suspect, suspect you would have to tackle that in the climate bill, but I'm just looking for an indication from the Cabinet Secretary, because I think she's indicated before she's sympathetic to this argument, as to, to whether there would be something in the climate bill and what it might look like. I am sympathetic to the idea um, in terms of the uh, of the, the scrutiny. Um, the, the, the various scrutiny reports um, have been helpful. Um, it is our intention to in increase the scrutiny period uh, uh, for future draft climate change plans. 
um, but I don't have a fixed period in mind. And it would be helpful, I think, if committees fed back on some of that in terms of the way uh, they think about how they work. Um, I, I certainly think the current timescales are too tight. Um, um, so allowing extra time would be helpful for everybody. But obviously, you don't want it to drift into a very long period of time either. So, so some feedback from committees uh, on this would be very useful. Um, but it is my intention to increase it and to, 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 to include that in, in the bill. Okay, I'm sure we'll take up that invitation. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Well, thank you, Convener. I, I was very pleased to see, uh, Cabinet Secretary, that there, I understand that there will be a stronger role for blue carbon in the final version of the plan, and I wonder if um, you could clarify for the committee any more detail of that and what the research implications might be for uh, the next RPP. Uh, yes, I think the, the, timing of the, the, the timing of the publication of the draft climate ch change plan meant that it was coming out before the work that was being done uh, on uh, blue carbon. And, uh, I mean, obviously in February, SNH did, do, uh, did publish uh, a report um, on, this, uh, on this issue. Um, actually, Marine Scotland is currently developing a research programme uh, in conjunction with SNH um, and a number of academic institutes to, to build on the findings of the SNH report and the other research. Um, so the final uh, plan will therefore have a focus on our understanding of blue carbon and its potential. So that will be one of the big differences between the original draft and the, and the final plan. Um, uh, so I don't know whether or not, um, uh, Mike, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, simply to say that we, you know, we have great aspirations for the for the potential there, and uh, um, uh, we, we think that's a very promising partnership with SNH, and uh, looking forward to taking that forward. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Mark um, I think there's an increasing understanding around the world from different states of the need to meet the Paris Agreement through setting zero carbon targets at state level. Can you just explain the work that the Scottish Government is doing in the context of the bill to consider a zero carbon target for Scotland? Well, the Committee on Climate Change um, uh, didn't propose uh, a zero uh, uh, carbon target either for the UK or for Scotland. Um, so, um, as is normal, what we do is uh, abide by the advice that we get from the Committee on Climate Change. Um, uh, I think I've indicated that that would be an ambition, but at present the bill isn't intended uh, to uh, design that into uh, the future climate change targets. Um, I, I appreciate what you say about the UK Climate Change Committee, but when it came to the climate change plan, a lot of the recommendations of the UKCC you considered, um, found them useful contributions, but then rejected. So. I, I'm interested to know, given the international precedent that's being set on zero carbon targets, how, how seriously you're investigating this as an option? Well, you know, we're intending to increase the target to 90%. Um, that has been described as um, extremely stretching by the Committee on Climate Change, but just at the limit of what is doable. I'm not sure at this point opting for something which um, is widely perceived as simply not doable is an advisable thing to put into a piece of legislation. Um, that doesn't preclude uh, uh, if circumstances change. I mean, this, is, this will be the second climate change bill. I'm guessing between now and 2050, there will be other climate change bills um, uh, at a certain point. Um, zero, zero carbon may become uh, um, effectively a doable uh, um, target, but we've taken the view that right now the 90% is about as far as we think we can um, reasonably uh, commit to. Um, what, why, why is that the case? What would be the impact of adopting a zero carbon target? Well, it would roll back into uh, some of the decision-making that would have to be taken between now and then um, uh, in terms of uh, what we think is, is manageable and doable. Uh, we believe that 90% is going to be tough enough 
without pushing further to what is effectively 100%. Okay, let's move us on. Uh, uh, Peter Chapman. Hi, good morning. I was going to ask something about the land reform uh, bill and, and the, specifically about the, the commission, which is now in place. And uh, they are required to uh, come forward with a strategic plan and programme of work within six months for, for their first three years in post. And I was wondering what discussions you've had with the Land Commission on that and how the, uh, the programme of work is coming along and, and whether it will be ready before, before September of this year. And if so, when you would uh, likely approve it. Um, well, I've had informal discussions uh, uh, with the Land Commission, but I've not yet had a formal conversation with them uh, about the three-year strategic plan or their programme of work. Um, you know, one of the reasons we've set up the Land Commission uh, is to ensure that they've got um, some freedom to go about their business um, without a constant ministerial uh, 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 eye over their, their shoulder. They're currently um, uh, uh, developing uh, their programme of work, um, and those who have been following the Land Commission uh, at all will know that they're conducting engagements around the country. They've, they've, uh, they've gotten themselves out and uh, about, and they've got a long list of uh, places they're going to visit. Um, but they, uh, they will, in the terms of the 2016 Act, uh, uh, required to um, submit uh, their um, uh, plan or the programme of work to me uh, before the end of uh, September. Um, I would obviously uh, need to take uh, a little time to, uh, uh, to look at it, um, but they are, and I would, I would see it in draft form, so I, I would get a, a slightly advanced view on this. Mm. Uh, I know that they're planning a land reform conference at the end of September, and I expect what they would like is to have the ministerial approval, and that's what I would be trying to do uh, at that point. I mean, I, mm. you know, if it comes up to me the night before the conference, we may be struggling a bit, but um, I'm assuming that that's not likely to happen. Um, uh, but uh, we are aiming at that target, sticking mm. to September, and they've set up an annual conference at the end of September, so everybody's gearing up and working towards that, and I suspect... Um, it would be a disappointment to everybody, including themselves, if they weren't able to stand at the conference and, and have that as part of their big presentation. OK, from that, we can take it. They're on track. Well, hopefully, they're on track. <laughs> I wonder about the, the sums of money involved. I mean, the grant and aid allocation of 1.4 million. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder how that was calculated. And I believe they're, they're, they're looking at employing up to 20 staff. How many have already been are in place just now? And how many there are, seven. Are, are there still 20? To, is the plan to go to 20 or is the need to go to 20? Well, they've, they've got seven in place at the moment. I think um, the, the commissioners are being cautious about this, um, uh, understandably, um, mm. until they've completed work on the strategic plan, because the strategic plan, I suppose, will then uh, give them a clear understanding of what potential staffing they might need uh, um, in, in the future. Um, uh, and some of that money uh, will also be used for consultation and external advice. It's not all meant to be about staff. So they'll be taking a, a kind of um, sensible and cautious uh, look at this. Um, and as I said, seven at the moment, I think there's a I'm not sure if the most recent appointment is considered is included in the seven or will make it eight. Um, sure. uh, I know there's one starting, I think, next Monday, a new, one, a new start next Monday. Um, so I'm not quite sure whether that seven includes that one yeah. or whether that makes it eight. Uh, but that's okay. where we are. Who's asking that? Who's asking that? Who's asking that? Yeah. Um, just moving on from that, I would, I would like an update on work in relation to the cre creation of the Register of Controlling Interests okay. on, on land and the, the creation of a right to buy land to further sustainable development. How's, how's that all coming together and how's that coming forward? I think I wrote to the committee last week um, about this, uh, the, the Register of Controlling Interests. Uh, uh, the work is uh, ongoing. Um, we did consult on outline proposals last September 
And uh, in fact, tomorrow there's going to be a factual analysis of the responses will be published tomorrow. Um, and the committee will again will be notified when that uh, when that takes place. So in a sense, that work is just simply progressing. Um, uh, uh, and we have to uh, liaise with the UK government um, uh, on on this as well. Um, uh, we, 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 we've got to be careful not to impose requirements on companies and other legal entities that could result in double reporting. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the work is actually ongoing um, and uh, from that respect, um, uh, things are uh, working to plan. Our intention has been to lay the regulations in November this oh. year. Um, again, uh, you know, there's a question of the, the government's, um, the UK government's legislative programme. We need to look at what that is going to mean uh, in terms of us. So I'll be writing to the committee with a further update once we've taken that into account. On the other issue of the right to buy land to further sustainable development, um, that introdu the introduction of that right to buy has been uh, deferred. Um, and the reason for that was to allow the other right to buy of abandoned, neglected and detrimental land to settle in. Um, so we'll be carrying out some stakeholder engagement uh, on this latter one, the abandoned, neglected and net detrimental land right to buy over the summer. Um, so the regulations in respect of that are likely to be laid sometime in autumn. So we're quite a way away from um, looking at the, at the one which um, uh, you have raised. We, we look at the appropriate time to bring forward that further right to buy um, uh, at, at, at that point. But again, I'm, you know, I'm conscious of the, the caution I've, I've indicated about and what do you, do you time will be available for things. Do you feel that the, the Brexit, uh, you know, all the work around Brexit is, is impl impacting on that, some of that work or not? I, well, I don't know. It isn't at the moment. The point I'm making at the moment is we did make a policy decision to go first with the, the, the right to buy and the detriment, you know, the, 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 the derelict and neglected land mm. and to proceed with that. And that would be, you know, the idea would be towards the end of this year. Um, it does take time to, to, to get these things uh, sorted out. What I can't say is whether or not some of the the flow on from Brexit will impact on the timetable, not just for this, but for other things, right, right across the board. That that is something that we can't. I can't make a um, uh, a, a proper um, uh, statement of. Okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Just on the subject of completing the land register, uh, cabinet secretary, if memory serves, public bodies are supposed to complete that by the 2019, but it's been suggested to us that local authorities aren't in any way compelled to do this and that some local authorities are not progressing this at a rate we might all have wanted. I'm just wondering if you have any sight of that and if there's any moves on the part of the Scottish Government to encourage them to participate in this process. I'm not aware of that, not cited on any of that, so it would be interesting if, if you have um, indication or evidence on the record of that being the case would be okay. helpful if you directed us to that. I think we have an intention to write to you on a number of subjects we won't cover today. We can perhaps do that okay. in that letter. Okay. Okay. Uh, moving on, Kate Forbes. Great. Thanks very much. I would like to ask a question about part four of the Community Empowerment Act, which was consulted on in March 2016 and which, just for the record, introduces a new provision for community bodies to purchase land which is abandoned, neglected or causing harm to the environmental well-being of the community. Could I ask what the, if the Cabinet Secretary has any details on the next phase of consultation in terms of who will be consulted and whether the draft regulations will be um, public and when uh, secondary legislation might be brought before the committee? Um, well, I think we're um, on the verge of consulting. I think the plan is to consult on that over summer. Um, and... Uh, uh, um, and that will include stakeholder engagement, so we will be bringing um, people together. <coughs> the plan at the moment is to make and lay the regulations in late autumn. So, I don't know, maybe November, something like that. Um, all things staying <laughs> stable. Um, that's, that's the plan. 
Um, but, uh, uh, you know, if there are more details around the, the engagement... Uh, the, will, will it be the same stakeholders that were consulted in 2016, in March 2016? Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be. That would be the core group that you would go back to for obvious reasons. But, you know, there may be, if there's others out there that, um, that members feel uh, we ought to specifically reach out to, then there's no, no harm in increasing that. Okay. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary, could I um, turn the uh, discussion to the Forestry and Land Management Scotland Bill, which um, I've um, been asked by the committee to be a reporter on the REC Committee for um, during the duration of this um, bill. And um, I wonder if you could clarify for, for this committee, which has an interest in relation to plant health and um, land reform and climate change, although we've stressed the need to mainstream the climate change aspects, um, what involvement you've had in the development of the consultation uh, of, for this bill? Um, well, it's not my bill. It's not this. It's not a portfolio bill, um, and um, uh, uh, the policy and consultation process um, is generally uh, um, supported by uh, cabinet. Um, uh, but it is clearly being taken forward by uh, a different portfolio by Fergus Ewing, um, the Cabinet Secretary. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my involvement, therefore, in that sense, is more peripheral um, and not um, as, as um, uh, not as detailed as it might be um, if it was one of the bills that I was actually taking forward. Um, um, I'm conscious that there's a... A um, bit of an issue around some of the um, sections of it. Um, I think it's fair to say that I, I met the NFUS on Thursday and they didn't raise any issue with me on this, so I'm, I'm not clear the extent of that, um, of that concern. Um, uh, the bill is about land management, it's not about land ownership. So it's not, it's, it's, it's a kind of slightly uh, different uh, uh, um, set of legislation. It, it is supposed to complement um, land reform and community empowerment agendas. Um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, as I indicated, I've not, I've not had any stakeholders flag up to me that they had any issues around this bill um, or have alerted me to any concerns that there may be. Um, so I'm not sure whether or not... Um, members of this committee have a different view? Well, um, having, I only attended the session uh, last week, um, because that's when I was asked to become a, a reporter for this committee, but um, the, the section 13 um, does actually um, state that Scottish ministers must manage land mentioned on, uh, in one of the subsections for the purpose of furthering the achievement of sustainable development. But those definitions appear to be somewhat different to the Land Reform Act, as it now is, and the Community Empowerment Act. So I think from that perspective, and also from the perspective of the, um, the point that, that was also made in the committee, in the uh, REC committee last week, that... Um, there is the possibility of compulsory purchase of land, and not only forestry land, but other land, I, uh, in, in quotes, that this might be something that um, this committee, uh, through myself, could ask if you would, uh, you would have a look at. Yeah, um, as I indicated, the bill's about land management, not land ownership, uh, uh, But there is a compulsory purchase. And yeah, if, if you'd just let me um, come to it, I'm trying to just work through the, 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 the issues. Um, the definition of community body used in the bill is the one currently in law and already updated uh, in the Community Empowerment Act, so it's using uh, those same uh, definitions. Um, the use of compulsory purchase is available as a backstop power, um, and there are a lot of checks and balances provided through the legal procedure and the various policy guidelines uh, in place. I think, as I understand it, the approach is to enable Scottish ministers via the new agency that this sets up to manage more, more than forestry land in the future. So it does um, uh, provide the potential to use the skills and experience of professional land management um, to manage other publicly owned land in the national interest. Um, so uh, I think that perhaps, as I indicated, having met with NFUS last week, this wasn't an issue that was raised. 
um, perhaps, uh, um, you know, I'd, it would be helpful if I had more tangible kind of concern expressed, if there really is a concern, but it's not coming through to me um, uh, uh, as an issue. It may possibly be, Cabinet Secretary, that um, it's not coming through to you in the way that it didn't come through to our committee until I went yeah. to the REC committee. Yeah. And there is also the issue of, from my reading of it, um, my view is that the definition of community bodies is slightly different. And I, and I just have a concern as well about the compatibility between the, what are now the two acts and, and this bill going through. Well, from my advice, the definition of community body used in the bill is the one currently in law and updated in 2015 via the Community Empowerment Act. So, you know, if there's a, if, if there's a factual kind of difference there between my advice and the reality, then we can try and explore that. Keith, do you want to come in? Uh, really just to, to confirm that there's certainly no intention in the Forestry and Land Management Bill to have any difference in definition or meaning from uh, the definitions in the existing legislation. Right, well, uh, perhaps if, if I can write about that yeah, rather than take yeah. up more time with the committee at the moment, that okay. might be very helpful for our committee. Thank okay. you. Thank you, uh, Claudia. Uh, moving on, Finlay Carson. Thank you. Uh, it's regarding um, MPAs, and an example is that why uh, Loch Caron wasn't protected in the original round of MPA designation. Um, in light of, of that being highlighted, what other locations might be vulnerable to dredging? Um, and, and how, how are you going about uh, identifying these areas that may be identified as MPAs in the future if, if we see uh, damage done by dredging and so on? Well, M the MPA network, MPAs are meant to show uh, um, uh, a number of different features. Uh, the, the, the idea of an MPA isn't generally um, simply one feature. Um, and uh, flame shell beds are, in fact, well represented in the existing uh, MPA network. There were um, five MPAs uh, previously designated for flame shell beds. Um, I, I won't list them, and all of them uh, have a dredging ban already in place. The MPA network was designed to be representative um, uh, and not necessarily protect every example of every single thing. Uh, so the five sites that were originally designated were considered to be sufficient representation uh, for flame shell beds. Um, and at the time they were chosen, it was considered that they were better overall value for the MPA network. And that's why Loch Caron wasn't in the original uh, selection. Um, but that network, the existence of that network, doesn't mean that all other examples uh, obviously should be um, forgotten about. And there's, you know, the, the, the other designation is the, the priority marine features. Uh, and what we've said we intend to do uh, is review that particular network of prior priority marine features uh, uh, to ensure that there's adequate protection beyond the MPA network and that we aren't dropping the ball in any particular one. Um, uh, that, that's going to be a three-year project. That's a lot of work uh, involved uh, in doing that. Um, and, uh, sorry, two-year project. Um, so there'll be a lot of environmental e economic assessment of potential solutions uh, around that. Um, the, the, the emergency... Uh, work in terms of Loch, Loch Caron was to, to stop in its tracks any further attempt to do what was done uh, was done there, and members will remember that that has to come back again um, within two years. It's not a it's not a permanent um, designation. Um, obviously, this will involve quite a lot of stakeholder uh, uh, involvement. Um, there will be public consultation, and I'm talking about the Priority Marine Feature Review. Um, there will be a public consultation process. Um, and then uh, I think Marine Scotland's intending to make information uh, about the project available once we've worked through uh, all of the detail. Um, so that, that, is the, the, uh, that is the proposal. That, that's how we're going to take this forward. I think the experience of what happened at Loch Caron has made us take a step back and look at 
beyond just the MPA network about what's actually needed in some of these sites. Um, mm -hmm. The member will be aware that there's some pressure for a blanket ban uh, right around the coast, yep. but clearly that has enormous economic implications as well. So we're trying to find the right balance here uh, um, between those two, uh, uh, those two things. Um, and so, that's why we want to do the detailed work that we've set out. I think you've answered my next question, which was... Sorry. <laughs> basically, what further work are you going to do to manage the existing sites? And, and I know Marine Scotland have said they're going to work with stakeholders. Well, those stakeholders uh, include enforced inshore fishery bodies, uh, which could potentially lead to uh, the MPAs, including fishery management tools to look at a more sustainable inshore fishery, which... Uh, in turn also uh, mm -hmm. has regard to yes. MPAs. Yes, and, and, and it is worth remembering and putting on record that there are a lot of different fishing industries and, and fishing interests here. Mm -hmm. The dredgers are only one um, form, the creelers are another, yeah. uh, the um, uh, White Fish Producers Association a, 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 a third, um, and, and they don't necessarily all agree with each other on every single aspect. So there's a tendency to assume that the fisheries sector speaks with only one voice, when in actual fact it doesn't. So there will again be a balance have to be managed between all of that. Um, I, I, I think it's going to be quite an interesting and yeah. possibly difficult <laughs> exercise to, to carry out because um, speaking to them about fisheries management can often create some um, tension. Yeah, I think there's certainly my example would be again Loose Bay, where we, we've uh, there, there's a ban on mobile dredging gear, but there's an argument within some environmentalists and also fishermen that the lack of dredging in some places has actually reduced the the, the, the potential for for habitats for some fish and whatever. And there needs to be a far more joined up approach between the, the fishing industry and the environmentalists so, to achieve a more sustainable fishery. Um, yes, that, 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 in an ideal situation, I think we would be able to get everybody around the table and talk this through, and I'm hoping that that's what, what we can get from this. I think that, that's, um, that, that would be uh, extremely helpful. I, I could maybe just add, as, as an illustration of that, that uh, the Marine Protected Area Strategy that we, that we published just in the last few days is looking at how to do joint monitoring of marine protected areas with fishermen. So what we're proposing to do using funding sourced from the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund is to contract inshore fishermen uh, to help us with that monitoring job. And I think by doing that in partnership with the fishermen, we will get... Um, uh, um, a very good engagement with the fishermen, a better mutual understanding between ourselves, the environmental community and the fishing community about what the right kind of proportionate balance is in terms of the monitoring and management measures that, that, that need to be put in place uh, for the designated MPAs. So we're, we're, we really welcome this approach where we, can, where we can use the assets that fishermen have to help us do the monitoring. I'm going to let Angus MacDonald come in here with a very specific point on Loch Carran. Okay, uh, thanks, Convener. Yes, um, specifically with regard to Loch Carran um, Argent Marine Conservation Order, there are, as you know, Cabinet Secretary uh, issues with, the de with regard to the detail of the boundary. Um, we're told the map is correct, however, there's a, an, anom an anomaly uh, with regard to the, the stated written geographic boundary uh, of the MCO. So. I'm concerned that there may be some confusion on the, the local the, the local fishermen's part um, regarding the boundary and the knock-on effect that that has on enforcement. Um, so um, can you advise us if, if Marine Scotland officers are helping to provide clarity to the fishermen over the summer period, given that it won't be coming back to this committee until after recess? We'll need to come back to the committee on that. That's a very kind of detailed question, and I don't, I don't want to kind of waffle an answer. Um, uh, if, uh, if there is a far more specific one can be provided. Um, so we okay. undertake to come back to the member and but the committee you, you, on that. You, you, you will take on board the, the, the concern that, um, that <coughs> there is an anomaly there that uh, could cause confusion. We of an anomaly. Um, so okay. um, let, us, let us go back and have a look at that. Okay, thanks. If we mark Roscoe. Um, yeah, Cabinet Secretary, I think when your officials were with us earlier on this month, um, they said that the Scottish Government had 
and I quote, got lucky with recreational divers being on the scene at Loch Caron to monitor the damage. So, you know, there's clearly an issue there about ongoing management and monitoring uh, of these MPAs. But your official also said, said that um, the government may consider a, a distance ban. I, I know you've, you've referred to that, a distance-based ban. Uh, on banning dredging out to a particular limit. That may be something that you can consider. I know you've already alluded to the fact that, that that's, you know, that's a tool in, in the box, not necessarily a tool you're going to use, but can, can, you, can you sort of expand on that a bit more about what consideration that you're giving to that? Well, I mean, principle amongst the consideration would be if you impose a blanket ban um, uh, on the order that's being suggested, you would effectively decimate the industry. So that can't be excluded from consideration, in my view. So we need to be, you know, in order to, to, to take that step, uh, you would have to be in a position of feeling that there really was no other alternative uh, uh, than, uh, than that. And, you know, Loch Caron, uh, hadn't been dredged, as I understand it, for something like 10 years. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a situation where there was uh, a constant, consistent, irresponsible um, dredging going on uh, in an area. Um, so I think we would, we would want to be very careful um, about going uh, uh, to that level of response, given the implications uh, and uh, trying to work through what kind of proper management can be agreed with all sectors of the fishing industry. I mean, MPAs don't exclude all fishing. They, they, they are managed areas. So the question then becomes, how do we manage uh, even the, the inshore um, as, as best as possible? And, you know, I've already uh, put on record my uh, grateful thanks to those volunteer divers, well, recreational divers, who uh, uncovered this. Um, you know, members will, I, I suppose, accept that it is impossible to have a monitoring regime that monitors every single feature round the clock um, uh, uh, over, you know, years and years. So we do rely on a variety of different reporting mechanisms and recreational divers are a very important part of that network. Okay. Uh, you, you the word, um, decimate, I mean, that suggests that you've come to a conclusion on this, or certainly on the principle of a ban out to a certain level. I've seen the numbers, and I know what the impact would be if we imposed a ban out to a certain level um, on a particular industry. Now, um, no government will ever say never, but the fact is, if you're going to move to that kind of decision, then you need to be very conscious of the implications of it um, for a huge part of our uh, of coastal communities and the coastal economy. Okay. Thank you. Uh, finally, on this topic, uh, Kate Forbes. Earlier, you talked about bringing everybody around the table. Just wondering if there is any updates on the Small Isles MPA. Um, Small Isles MPA. And if not, then I can... Yeah, I think, yeah, we're, we're consulted. The, 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 um, the remaining inshore MPA fisheries measures will be consulted on at the end of 2017. Um, uh, so uh, um, that, will, um, uh, that will include uh, uh, more work in respect of of all of that. There's more work required um, on an effective management proposal at the Small Isles. Um, <coughs> the updated proposal will become part of that wider planned consultation. So we're working very hard to try and, you know, get people to, to an agreement uh, around that. Um, uh, and then that will feed into the wider uh, uh, consultation. Um, so uh, it's a... It's, uh, I think there's 21 sites going to be part of that wider consultation, so it's a big programme of work. Thank you. Of which the Small Isles is one part. And as if to perfectly illustrate the width of your remit, Cabinet Secretary, we're going to move from MPAs to waste now. Uh, Richard Lyle. <laughs> Stolen my first couple of words that I was going to say, how impressed I am with the, your wide remit. Um, 
The Government's programme for Scotland 2016-17, including commitments to introduce a circular economy and zero waste bill in the second half of the parliamentary session. What issues does the Scottish Government plan to include in the circular economy and zero waste bill, and when do you plan to consult on this, and will you meet the timescales as previously agreed? And what work are you doing to ensure the target to ban the disposal of biodegradable waste to landfill by 2021 and recycle 70 per cent of all the Scotland's waste by 2025 can be achieved? Well, the Circular Economy Bill uh, is presently scheduled towards the end of the parliamentary session, so uh, it's, it's not imminent. Um, uh, the priorities have already been set out in the strategy, making things last, so people can see uh, um, uh, from that what our priorities uh, are likely to be. So that's design, reuse, repair, recycling, etc. But also food and the bioeconomy, construction, energy infrastructure, remanufacture. So it's quite a substantial part. And, and to be fair, it will probably include. Um, some other colleagues in other portfolios um, in respect of this. Um, uh, uh, we have a lot of work to do uh, to raise awareness of the economic opportunities. Um, so we are engaging with businesses um, and that is a priority for early engagement during this year and that is working towards the ultimate goal of the Circular Economy Bill. Um, in terms of the uh, uh, work towards um, targets, the recycling targets uh, that we've set do provide a, a clear direction of travel for business and local authorities. And uh, um, for the moment, what we're trying to do is, is work, transition through that 2020 milestone as smoothly as possible. Um, uh, and that's to ensure that we don't end up with excess energy from waste infrastructure that undermines the high quality recycling. There's, there's a kind of balance often in, in, in inherent in all of this. That we're trying to keep things manageable. Um, local authorities obviously have to put arrangements in place to meet their own statutory duties. And I think SEPA are uh, um, currently working on technical guidance for them uh, uh, in terms of their uh, post-2020 um, requirements. Uh, on recycling performance, the current number of local authorities signed up to the recycling charter is 25 out of the 32, so we're making progress on that. But obviously local authorities that sign up don't overnight suddenly comply. They sign up to begin the work towards uh, compliance. Um, so Zero Waste um, Scotland is working with them to implement the transition plans. Now, I've got an open mind on what we can do uh, to, to really accelerate this and I'd be intending to visit Wales this summer because Wales um, performs incredibly well in this regard. So I'm um, away down there to see if I can find out what can be translated back uh, to Scotland um, from the Welsh experience. And it's about learning from others as well as presuming that we can always come up with the solutions ourselves. My next question uh, is in regard to the deposit return scheme. Is the Scottish Government planning to make a decision on whether to move forward with proposals to introduce a, de a deposit return system in Scotland, bearing in mind the recent concerns voiced by the Scottish Grocers Federation, who actually wrote to some of the, us in this committee this week, uh, representing over a thousand retailers. I have to also declare I was a grocer for 14 years. Uh, and also st others stacking up against this change in re recycling. Why would we want to do this? Well, I mean, obviously there's a, there's a big debate around this um, and um, uh, we, we've undertaken to do as much work as is possible on this and look at um, uh, uh, different ideas around this. In actual fact, the final stakeholder workshop um, is happening today um, on, on, the, uh, on this phase of discussion on deposit return. Um, deposit return would be included if we were going to go down that road. Whatever we chose to do in that would be part of the circular economy bill, so we're not under uh, immediate pressure in terms of legislation. Um, I know that the, uh, 
the committee had a subgroup working on this. I think from what I can see, it was uh, very useful, but I think it pretty much highlighted how complex this is and how right we are not to simply jump to an immediate answer without thinking through the implications, including for uh, um, the small corner grocers who neither have the space nor the staff or, or, the, or the infrastructure to deal with some of this. Um, and indeed, um, uh, Richard Lyle's correct to flag up the potential contradiction between the imposition of higher recycling targets uh, if you take away a big stream of potential recyclate from, uh, from the market. So there's, there's a lot of complex issues to consider here. Um, and I think we've done the right thing by ensuring that we speak to as wide a group of people as possible um, uh, and really think through the implications of this. Um, I know that some of the bigger companies, some companies have indicated that they have a change of mind on this. Others are still adamantly uh, opposed. There's no unanimity out there amongst uh, the commercial stakeholders. Um, uh, in terms of the environmental stakeholders, uh, um, there's perhaps more of a sense that we should have some kind of system. Um, but then there is the contradiction with taking recyclate away from um, other potential market. So it, it, it isn't just as simple and straightforward as it sometimes first looks. Can I thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for your honesty and your uh, uh, decision on, uh, hopefully, uh, we'll come down against, but we'll wait and see. <laughs> well, the work is ongoing. As I've thank indicated, you. the stakeholder event starting today, it's the final one, but we're not, um, we're not, you know, we're, we want to explore every single option on this. Could I just uh, ask a brief supplementary cabinet search just about um, whether the, and if so, when the stakeholder event information will be published so that the committee could actually consider that as well? That's a good question, to which I don't have an answer. Can we get back to you on that one? Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, uh, Emma Harper. Uh, convener. Um, I'm interested in air quality. The Scottish Government's Cleaner Air for Scotland uh, strategy aims for Scotland to have the best air quality in Europe. And on the 2nd of May, the committee took evidence from stakeholders and academics on air quality in Scotland. And recently we had uh, a debate, and many of us in the committee spoke about air quality and quoted stats and facts and the, talking about the importance of tackling air quality. So it's obviously creeping up the agenda and I'd like to acknowledge that you have a really extremely wide portfolio cabinet secretary as has been mentioned already so um, if we're looking at development of low emission zones would we um, I would be interested to know what your comments are regarding the evidence that uh, shows that low emission zones are effective in reducing lo uh, local pollution levels and improving public health but also, I'm also interested in what seems like the costs just seem to stack up when we're looking at the evidence, the costs of creating and running low emission zones, the technology, the retrofitting of buses, the purchasing of new buses. It's a logistical major challenge. So what are your thoughts about that, the evidence and then the costs? Well, it's, um, uh, from my understanding is that there's kind of evidence can be found either way um, in, this, in this regard. And I suppose ultimately um, what it comes down to is how the LEZ is, def is actually defined, how it's, how it's designed. Um, uh, there were LEZs in Dutch cities that didn't actually make any difference. Um, uh, LEZs, um, uh, what, for example, the Berlin LEZ did, uh, make um, a fairly significant difference, but the difference is not, you know, it tends to be up to about 10% reduction in, in, in emissions levels. Um, and th there, is a, there is a literature review by academics, it's called Air Use, um, and it's been published this year. I don't know if the committee had, um, might want to go and have a look at that. Um, basically confirming that the outcomes are hugely dependent on local factors. Um, the size, the operational scope, the traffic data robustness, local meteor meteorology. I mean, I, you know, depending on what you do might, might result in an outcome that is better uh, or worse. But the best appear to 
um, manage um, uh, the Berlin LEZ was seven to ten percent reduction in NOx. Um, a, one localized study in London said three to seven percent. So we're talking within that in that ballpark by the look of it. Um, in fairness, I think uh, we now have two local authorities in Scotland who are actively um, wanting to discuss uh, a, a low emission zone. That's both Glasgow and Edinburgh, which is heartening that, that there are two who are you know, actively interested in this, uh, in this now. Um, uh, and, I, and again, I suppose the costs and benefits reflect back on what I've said about the evidence will depend entirely on what you um, what you choose to do, and I think you made some, you made some, you offered some examples, but of course the reality is uh, um, that might not be how it's set up. So uh, you know you, the the, the um, uh, you know the way the way you do it may have different impact. Um, uh, so really, it's a kind of balance um, and. Um, for those that are those local authorities that are interested in in this, that will be the ones where I think there is the most the, and the, the biggest um, uh, uh, areas of of harmful emissions. I, th I think the debate that you were talking about was taken by public health colleagues, which I think is a was a very appropriate thing to do because this is a public health issue. Um, but um, clearly, we have to have some indication of what will be the most effective. Um, way of reducing uh, of reducing emissions. Just a quick sup, and I, <coughs> you mentioned that two councils to, or two local authorities are interested in um, a low emission zone. And last week, Friends of the Earth were in my office, basically saying, um, "Is it possible to have more than one pilot, or do we stick with one pilot? Is uh, what's the best way forward?" Uh, well, they cost money; um, they're not cost free, so we have to try and be. Uh, sensible about it. Um, the, the idea of a pilot is to is to tease out some of the issues I've indicated from that evidence, um, uh, uh, and 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 see if there's a particular model which would work effectively. Um, uh, um, you know, I, I w in an ideal world, I would I would you know like to see lots and lots of pilots doing lots and lots of different things, but there isn't really going to be the capacity to do that. So the idea is that we'll, uh, we'll try and find one to do the initial pilot, and then that will help us inform um, rollout if other local authorities wish to, go, uh, wish to go ahead. So no decision yet has been taken uh, about where that might be. David Stewart, very briefly. Uh, Cameron Secretary, I could ask a very quick technical question, and by all means, please write if you don't have it uh, in front of you. I, I was getting a brief about the London LEZ, and they were telling me about the fantastic vehicle recognition software that was available. So every entrance and exit to London, uh, they're able to detect the vehicle and charge accordingly. So for example, a Euro 6 diesel would be exempt because it's not emitting, and the one that's not exempt would automatically be charged. So, so the reason I'm asking this is, I, I obviously am enthusiastic about LEZs. I, I would like to see as many, as Emma's point, as many cities as possible go for this. But it's very much about what are you applying for. If that technology is going to be there or paid for, that's a Rolls-Royce approach, which is very effective. But if it's not going to be there, I can understand why local authorities might be reluctant to apply. I mean, Glasgow wrote to me and said that the London example, I think they said on memory, was uh, over 100 million. It is very expensive. But the whole of London is covered. Now, I'm subject to contradiction. I don't think any Scottish city has a complete 360 degree um, approach that London has on this. Um, I know there's some technology available for vehicle recognition. I mean, is that something that government's thinking about or is it not that level of LEZ that's been planned? Well, at the moment, um, there, there's no specific detail uh, in terms of planning and that's you know, what some of the conversations are about, what, what a local mm. authority would, um, uh, would, would like to see and where. And you know, it's, it's, there's also no requirement you know, for it to be a big bang approach. Mm. Um, you know, LEZs can, can start off in a very much more localised area and begin to expand depending on the, on the experience. So mm. different, different cities may have a different idea of, of how best to manage that process. Um, uh, but yes, it is, 
um, uh, it, it is expensive. There, money has to be invested, um, and and therefore I'm I'm just being cautious uh, about being able to do a big bang. You know, I suppose 100 million sort of job isn't mm. is, is is unlikely to be uh, to be manageable uh, manageable in the in in the current state of um, mm. uh, of finances. Mm. So it's therefore exploring with local authorities how this can be uh, uh, um, dealt with. I mean, I, I think Emma Harper talked about buses being having to be converted, but of course, in the early instance. You know, you may designate a, a, a small area into which buses don't go, right, or right. taxis don't go, or whatever. You you can come up with all sorts of potential ways around it that don't immediately trigger some of the massive investment, and it, it's a kind of signal then moving forward. And to be perfectly fair, I think that um, when it comes to a lot of these things, um, uh, um, fleet owners etc. are already moving themselves and their vehicles over um, as, as much as they possibly can. Mm. Uh, so, you know, one city may have a different idea of what their LEZ would look like compared to another city. Um, uh, our, our concern is just not to, not to be in a situation where we can't afford to do everything all at the same time, and therefore the ideal scenario is to find a pilot that begins mm. to show a way forward that will work right. across as many cities as possible. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on, Mark Roscoe. Um, st sticking with air quality, though, um, you'll be aware of the High Court judgment from last year that the UK's air quality plans, particularly on nitrous oxide, are, are not compliant with EU law. Uh, we're breaking the law, and as a result, you know, we're contributing towards a major public health crisis. Um, the Scottish Government plans are part of that overall UK plan. So what? action have you taken since that High Court ruling to ensure that the approach that the, that the Scottish Government is taking is compliant with those EU directives? Well, I, I did flag up the judgment immediately to my officials and said that may have been, you know, Westminster, but I didn't think we could ignore that in terms of the potential implications um, uh, for Scotland. So, um, you know, we are uh, um, working hard to try and um, Evidence that that what we're doing is is um, uh, is going to keep us compliant. Now, the the cleaner air for Scotland strategy set out a program of work. Um, we've kept it under review. We believe it remains fit for purpose in delivering against EU obligations. Um, and uh, um, our 2020 target was identified as a practical timeline. Um, and was part of the consultation process that led to the strategy. So um, while I've ensured that officials don't ignore the court case um, south of the border, um, we feel confident that the work that we are doing um, is getting us into the right place. Uh, it's not really clear to me, though, what that work actually is, what that change of approach is, Cabinet Secretary, because you said that we need to ensure that we stay compliant. I mean, the High Court ruling was that we're not compliant, so something has to change as a result. And, I, and I'm particularly thinking about Clean Air for Scotland, whether that will be reviewed, because I have asked this question now to the First Minister and to your colleague uh, Aileen Campbell in the debate that took place a couple of weeks ago, and I, I haven't had a clear answer yet. I think the First Minister talked about Clean Air for Scotland being a chapter in the UK plan. But this is a pretty serious judgment from the High Court, so I don't get a sense of how that approach in Scotland is being reviewed and whether um, you know, this committee or, or other stakeholders can actually in, input into that uh, plan to ensure it's compliant. So is it, it being reviewed? And, and it's what? kept under regular review. Um, the first progress report was published on the 15th of June. Um, uh, so that's just a few days ago, really. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, um, we're adding to the air quality budget to support actions in cleaner air for Scotland. So um, it is under constant review. It doesn't you know, require to be um, torn up and started again, mm -hmm. but we are keeping it under review. Um, and if, I mean, I, if you know, committee members want to have a look at the, um, 
the first progress report. It was just published last week. Is it, is it, is, would there be the opportunity to feed into that um, formally for external stakeholders and this committee to, for, well, to it's feed now, into a, a review of the strategy? It's now a progress. public report and, you know, uh, uh, as I indicated, we would keep it under regular review. It's perfectly open to any stakeholders to go and look at the, that first review um, and, and, then, and then come back uh, on, the, on, the, on the back of that. Thank you. Uh, moving on, um, Alex Burnett. Uh, thank you. If we could just uh, talk about f uh, flooding and, more importantly, flood prevention. Um, you know, this is a continuing cause of concern for my constituency, constituents in Kemeny and Ballater, uh, but could equally apply to any areas affected by the floods uh, last year. Um, as the Cabinet Secretary will be aware, um, the National Flood Risk Assessment uh, and identification of potentially vulnerable areas uh, is reviewed and republished on a six-year planning cycle, um, the next date for that being 2022. Um, you very kindly replied in, in last month when I wrote to you uh, saying that you had the power uh, under the Act uh, to review and, where appropriate, update the document uh, uh, at times out with this six-year cycle. Uh, however, there are no plans to use this power. Uh, can I ask why not? Um, because the work is uh, already ongoing on the second cycle. We're currently working uh, on that. Um, uh, no current plans um, to, to uh, um, upset that timetable. Um, uh, that can always change um, if, if the situation uh, changes, but the work is already being done um, and that will be providing the basis for the identification of the potentially vulnerable areas um, and local flood risk management plans and SEPA is actively involved in doing that. So I'm assuming that one of the things that we'll be looking at is the situation um, in, in uh, Aberdeenshire. Um, it will build on the first cycle. Um, it will review the method methodology in the first cycle. Uh, it will take on board new data and information and that includes the balloter uh, uh, situation, um, particularly um, when the new information uh, relates to climate change, community functionality, cohesion, isolation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, I think it's worth remembering that I mean this this is a huge step change in the way we've managed flood protection in Scotland, um, because this now um, provides a, a, a really transparent uh, uh, system of, of identification, um, a committed budget. Uh, which uh, is ensuring that these infrastructure projects uh, are put in place um, and identification of those uh, areas that are uh, uh, most in need. So the new cycle um, will have a lot of updated uh, information uh, included um, uh, and, uh, and will come forward with that, um, uh, that, that second cycle. Uh, of national flood risk assessment. This moves us away from um, a, a kind of scattergun approach, which was really the way it was being done um, previously. Um, and so uh, while it, it doesn't, uh, uh, while it's not impossible to imagine a scenario where you would move outside the cycle, we would want to minimize the likelihood of that happening simply because this process provides us with the most robust way of managing flood protection across, uh, across, uh, across the whole of the country. Um, uh, and we are constantly reviewing that. SEPA is constantly reviewing that kind of approach, uh, constantly looking at new research, constantly thinking about uh, new information uh, which, will, um, uh, which will change that. But you know, is, is that not exactly the point, Jeff? If the Act gives the scope to uh, review um, the plan outside of a six-year cycle, you know, what is the event that you are waiting for to, to use that power if it wasn't the scale of the floods that happened last year? Well, but that will be what one of the things that is being looked at very carefully by SEPA right now. Um, and uh, uh, at the moment, um, they're still confident that doing it on the cycle basis that was laid down by the legislation it continues to be um, the right way to uh, proceed. A lot of the PVAs will probably remain the same, but that review and revision process 
um, uh, will involve authorities and other stakeholders um, in terms of potential to update the list. Um, uh, but I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that we've already got a better, more consistent, more strategic approach uh, to the situation in Scotland. Um, and um, at the moment, we think it's better to stick with that um, uh, than, to, uh, than to upset it in the mid middle of the process. Because yeah. there's a lot of, I mean, the, 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 I mean, flood protection works are in place and committed to over an incredibly long period of time. I mean, some of the things that I've opened now were things that I signed off on between 2009, 2011, and they're only just now actually being built. So we kind of have to think into that longer term. OK, thank you. Briefly, Finlay Carson. Thanks. I, I, I appreciate what you're saying about a, a longer term approach to flooding, but that gives no reassurance to communities like Kersfair and my constituency or Newton Stewart that were hit by three major floods. Uh, and because they weren't part of a, a, a vulnerable zone, there was a reluctance on, on behalf of both the government and local authorities to actually take some action, which would have resulted in, in, in fewer homes being flooded in subsequent years. It, it, does there not need to be that level of uh, flexibility, as, as Alexander uh, set out, where it's pretty obvious that there's a flood risk, that it's not going to take six years for, for any flood, pre flood prevention work to be done in that community? Well, not all of the money that is committed to flood protection is, is, is committed just to PVA. So there is a um, proportion of the annual uh, budget that we've committed to. And flood protection is an unusual one in that we've committed over a very long period of time to an annual budget figure. Um, uh, and, and, you know, a proportion of that um, uh, is protected from simply being part of the PVAs. Um, th this will always be a, a difficult kind of process. And, and we are always subject to uh, uh, some of the uh, randomness of nature and climate change. Um, but at the moment, SEPA is still confident that what is being proposed is the best way for us to manage it. Um, and I suppose um, uh, there can be a conversation then about how the, how the balance of the money is being used um, uh, by, by local authorities. But that's a conversation we would need to have with COSLA as well, because they're also part of this conversation. Okay. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I think we've done very well to cover the subjects we have so far. We still have a number to do. It. Hopefully, these are short, sharp um, lines of questioning. Uh, Emma Harper. Thank you. Um, as you know, I'm interested in animal welfare, and uh, you wrote to us on the 10th of May with an update on animal welfare issues, including regulations regarding licensing of animal sanctuaries and rescue centres, rehoming centres, and the review of legislation on breeding and dealing of animals and, and other issues. So I'm just quick question, uh, any further update on any of these issues or any timetable proposed for action? Well, work is ongoing uh, on, on all of that, but of course it's the same team that uh, are involved in the uh, wild animals and travelling circuses bill, so there's a you know physical amount of space I have to give them to be able to drop things and put, put other things uh, in terms of priorities. So um, uh, we don't have um, absolutely specific time scales for every single one. Obviously, there's a piece of legislation going through, and that, in a sense, takes a bit of priority. Um, there's work being done on, uh, on other things. Um, some will involve <coughs> consultation uh, or further consultation. Some will not. So. Uh, at this stage, while everything is is being progressed, it's not all being progressed at the same speed, and nor will it, well, at least I'm sure the committee doesn't want it all to arrive in the committee's lap all at the same time either, um, which would uh, be um, be difficult. And I, I did talk about um, uh, a review of offences and Animal Health and Welfare Act. Um, uh, so, again, um, uh, 
you know, all of this is subject to some of the Brexit impact. So I'm, I'm having to think about what, you know, what I notionally might think of as being perhaps the more important bits as opposed to the bits that can be held if there's a big impact, if we've got to be looking at other things first. So uh, work is ongoing, um, but right now the legislation is priority for that team. Um, and then they will uh, uh, they will return and pick up on some of the other things. But I have no I have no specific timescales for any of the different sets of SIs that would emanate from this. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, can I ask Cabinet Secretary about SNH's report that's been carried out, uh, um, been produced on scoping a vision for the uplands, uh, when that's due, and how you would intend taking that forward? I think. The, the vision for the uplands is uh, um, the, the, the SNH report, which is scoping a, a kind of potential for the vision. I have to, have to remember it's not actually trying to scope the vision. It's, it's, okay. it's doing, it, it will be published soon. Um, it's going to make recommendations on the way forward. Um, Obviously, we'll consider those and we will come back and make our plans known. So, uh, but the report, my recollection is it's, it's due quite soon. So uh, we'll flag it straight up to committee when it, when it comes out. That would be useful because it's an area that we've uh, considered yep. taking a particular interest in and taking forward. Thank Indeed. you for that. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener. And Cabinet Secretary, could I ask you, um, in relation to deer management, which this committee has looked at in, in some detail, um, uh, whether uh, there will be a clear plan on deer management um, and when that will be published? Eminently. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we look forward to that, given our involvement in the issue. Um, another subject on a similar theme, uh, beavers. Uh, where are we at in terms of the secondary legislation? I'm conscious of the concerns out there about the practical implementation of whatever's brought forward. So I just want to get a hand on where you're at with that. We're still uh, um, uh, progressing work on the strategic environmental assessment and the habitats regulations assessment. Um, uh, when that work is done, uh, um, there will then be uh, 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 um, moving on to an SI, uh, a statutory instrument, um, which would add beavers to Schedule 2 of the Conservation Natural Habitats, etc. Regulations 1994. Um, we expect and hope to be able to do that later this summer. SNH is also currently working on a couple of aspects related to this. Um, I had asked them to to do a sort of mapping exercise that would show us what the natural expansion would look like um, uh, so that we can ascertain if a beaver suddenly pops up somewhere a very long way away that the likelihood is that's been deliberately transported as opposed to what might be considered to be a natural uh, um, uh, uh, travel. Um, so I've asked SNH to have a look at that. Um, and clearly they're also working on uh, a management um, tool for them to actually be ready for uh, when the statutory instrument is brought in, that they are then ready to actually work with and alongside um, landowners and land managers uh, on this issue. And as far as the management tool is concerned, they are currently engaging with land managers as to how this might work in practice. I, I see Keith Connell yes. on his head in agreement. Yeah. Yes. yes, as far okay. as I'm aware, yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I, this was one of the issues raised by the NFUS last Thursday. Yes, <laughs> I mean, understandably so yep. from the, the, the farmer's yep. pr perspective. And thank you for that. Mark Roscoe on aquaculture. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, Cabinet Secretary, about your, your leadership on this issue. Um, you've clearly got an issue with uh, the compliance rate with aquaculture at the moment. Um, and the figures that this committee had showed that uh, in relation to compliance. Compliance had actually gone down. It's one of the few sectors where compliance was slipping down below 90%. Um, do you believe that the current regulatory approach that CEPA are taking uh, with the aquaculture sector is really, is really working, um, particularly in light of you know, the ambitious expansion plans that the industry and, and government have, have got? Well, it's a, it's a huge industry. Um, it contributes enormously to um, the 
um, success of Scotland's food and drink. Um, it um, provides employment for a huge uh, number uh, of people, but I am obviously conscious that there's a um, big environmental uh, question um, in respect of, um, uh, of management. Um, uh, SIPA is the regulatory body, um, and they've only just yesterday, I think, published uh, um, uh, some uh, new uh, work that they're wanting to, to think about. Um, and um, it's, it's going to be controversial. Um, uh, it's um, uh, uh, so that there, uh, uh, there will be um, a lively conversation between the producers and, and SIPA um, and uh, the environmental sector about um, the way forward. And uh, uh, that is is very current. So the this new framework for a sustainable future for finfish aquaculture in Scotland, um, if members are not aware, that was just come out with yesterday. And I think there's been some industry response today to it, which suggests it's going to be a lively um, debate, mm -hmm. uh, which is what I would expect. Um, uh, there are some interesting developments in other countries that I've asked about, um, um, but you know we need to um, we need to kind of get people around the table. I mean, once again, I, I think the truth of the matter is that um, for those in the industry, it's actually in their best interests because you know change, which provides for healthier stock, um, uh, reduces stock losses. Uh, and all the rest of it is money in the bank for them in, in any case. Mm -hmm. um, but I suppose from their perspective, it's about what is manageable. Um, and then environmentally, we've obviously got to take on board um, a number of different considerations too. But that's very active and very current. Um, and if people are not aware of the, the proposals published by SIPA yesterday, um, I would urge them to go and have a wee look. <coughs> when we come back after the summer. Okay. Okay, okay. Thank you for that. Um, Finlay Carson. It follows directly on from, from Mark's question. I'm particularly interested in what work uh, will be done to establish whether there's a link between salmon fishing and the state of wild salmon. Um, but we, we had a, a draft wild fishery strategy on the 8th of February 2016. Can I ask you whether the measures introduced have met uh, their aims of improving the conservation status of uh, wild salmon? Um, and also, can I have an update on, on where we are with implementing the, the Fisheries Act, the Agriculture's Fisheries Act 2013, and when it's likely a wild fisheries bill will be introduced? Um, well, 2018 will be the third fishing season in which we've made conservation assessments. Um, in our view, it's a bit too early yet to assess uh, whether the measures introduced have met their aim. Um, we think it is going to need a little bit longer. Um, and we are going to be bringing forward regulations for the 2018 season later in this year. And I know the member has a very active interest in this and will want to look out uh, for those. In terms of the implementation of the 2013 uh, Act, uh, um, there's, uh, um, uh, we're working with the sector to deliver improvements and reform in advance of uh, legislation where possible. In terms of the World Fisheries Bill, um, the bill remains in the programme. Under current plans, we may bring it forward in year three, but uh, um, it really just depends on whether or not, again, we find ourselves bounced about by, uh, by things out with our control, but that's the current intention. Sorry? The B word again. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm just trying to be careful not to... To, to give an explicit commitment to a particular time when I can't be 100% certain that I can make it. Um, um, uh, so, but that's, that's, it. that's where it's penciled in at the moment. So we would be talking uh, the 18-19 parliamentary year, but probably not early in that year, probably later in that, in that year. For that uh, candle. Um, 
we'll just we finished the questions, but before I conclude the meeting, I'm going to allow Angus Macdonald to bring forward a point of clarification for the record. Yes, thanks, Can we I appreciate the, the opportunity on, on a point of, of clarification um, before you close the meeting. Um, during this evidence session, Richard Lyle earlier may have, albeit inadvertently, given the impression that the committee has already formed an opinion on deposit return schemes, uh, which is clearly not the case. Um, so I'd like to place on the record that the majority of members of this committee are keeping an open mind on DRS and we look forward to further consideration of the issue in the not too distant future. It is accurate to say that the committee hasn't come to a conclusion. Um, Cabinet Secretary, thank you. I do apologise if I, if it, uh, I, uh, and that was not the intention. No, I'm sure it wasn't. Thank you for that, Mr Lyle. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, thank you for your time. We've covered an incredible amount of ground. I think we've all illustrated the, the incredible remit that you have. Um, there are a number of issues I think you've indicated you'll come back. So there's a number of issues I've committed to come back to you on, um, but equally the offer is if there's anything that you feel that just time has precluded us getting to, we can, we can come back. And we will. Thank you for that. And thank okay. you for your time and that of your officials today and, and uh, wish you a, a restful uh, summer recess, if that's possible. Um, the, yes, the uh, committee... Um, expects the next meet after the summer recess on the 5th of September 2017 and as agreed we will now move into private session. I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is now closed.